How can we increase the number of doctors and patients who can try a new medicine that's in clinical trials when that medicine has shown a reasonable safety profile and has some possibility of benefit? And how can we do this in a way that doesn't derail ongoing research? We'll call this issue pre-approval access. And in the US, the set of regulations that allows it is called expanded access. When we say pre-approval access or expanded access, we're talking about investigational drugs. That means pharmaceuticals and biologics that are regulated by the FDA have a rationale for human use and are not currently approved for marketing in any disease or condition. Let's say we're a drug company with a new drug that may cure Alzheimer's. To evaluate its rationale for use in humans, we have to try it in humans in what we call clinical trials. But before you try any new drug in humans, you first have to submit something called an Investigational New Drug Filing, or IND. In your IND, you describe what you want to do with this unapproved product. It may be a first-in-humans safety trial, or it could be a dose-ranging proof-of-concept trial, or later on, perhaps a pivotal trial to prove efficacy. These are examples of research clinical trials, but there's something in addition that you can submit in your IND, and that is treatment use clinical trials. The key here is that any use of an unapproved drug has to be described in an IND and authorized by FDA. Since 1962, this is how the FDA oversees the development of new drugs. A trial can either be primarily for research or primarily for treatment use. Here's the difference. Research trials are the kinds of clinical trials we hear about all the time. They're required for generating the data to prove a product is ready for market. Drug companies have to be picky about who they study in a clinical research trial. Subjects should be as similar to each other as possible, and to measure drug effect, you have to try to exclude people whose outcome will be impacted by other medications, by comorbidities, or other unique factors. You also want to focus on patients who are at a stage of disease likely to have a worsening of symptoms if left untreated, and those who have the greatest potential treatment response. Of course, this leaves a lot of patients out, but research trials are for research, not treatment. They have to have strict enrollment criteria. Patients who are not candidates for a research trial but who still have unmet need for treatment options can be engaged through a treatment use clinical trial. In 1987, FDA wrote a set of regulations for treatment use trials and they named it expanded access. I try to remind people that these can enroll and monitor patients the same way research trials do. So I use the term expanded access trials or expanded access clinical trials, which is the proper term. But usually they're just called expanded access programs, which works just fine how early in the drug's development and how many patients you can include in your expanded access program are determined by the gravity of the disease. There's one set of requirements for serious diseases and another set of requirements for immediately life-threatening diseases or conditions. The disease and the clinical experience will determine how early in the development cycle and how large a program can be launched. They can be for patients who never met the enrollment criteria for research trials, or they can be an extension program just for the trial participants who would like to continue with treatment. Early access programs can also be used for products that are approved in other countries. There are many kinds. The requirements are easy to look up. They're in 21 CFR section 312, subpart I. It'll take you no more than 15 minutes to read all of it. There are four core requirements. First, it's got to be a serious or life-threatening disease with no meaningful treatment available. Second, the potential benefit of the drug must outweigh the risks in consideration of the seriousness of the disease. Third, the program must not interfere with ongoing research. And last, the primary objective must be treatment. Now that doesn't mean you can't use the outcomes for research, but research has to take a back seat to the primary goal of treatment access. Check back for our advanced expanded access workshops on data collection and biomarker discovery, cost recovery and payers, the old narratives of possible interference these programs have on research, and collaboratively sponsored access programs. Visit our website and YouTube channel for updates, and feel free to contact us if you have any questions.